Welcome to Electron Online. Here we're going to show you the third method of how to find the range in the domain of a polynomial. And again, it all comes down to finding the graph to be able to graph the polynomial. In other words, we want to find the roots. We want to find the max and min points or the local max and min points on the graph. What we're going to use here is the method of synthetic division. How do we do that? Well, we look at our polynomial. This is a third order polynomial. And there's a kind of a trick to it. So let at least set up how we're going to use synthetic division. We find the coefficients of each of the four terms in this polynomial. We write them down. So we have 1, negative 4, 1, and 6. We draw a line underneath it like that. And now we want to try some uh, numbers that we want to plug into x to see if that will give us the root or one of the roots to the equation. The way to do that is we look at the coefficient of the first term and we look at the constant coefficient in the back. And what we do is to, the numbers that we want to try to find the roots are going to be as follows. We take all the combinations of this number divided by this number. And not just this number, but the factors of that number. For example, the factors of 6 are as follows. The factors of 1, 2, 3, and 6. So with that, and then of course the factors of 1 is simply 1. So what we want to do is we want to realize that all the possible numbers we can plug in for 6 that will give us possible roots are these numbers divided by those numbers, which means 6 divided by 1, we can take the plus or minus. We have 3 divided by 1, plus or minus, Oops, plus or minus. We can have 2 divided by 1, plus or minus, and we can have 1 divided by 1, plus or minus. Now, if there were more than one possibilities here, of course, then we take this, these numbers here and divide them by all the possible factors of the coefficient of the first term as well. But in this case, all the possible numbers we want to plug into are equal to plus or minus uh, 6, plus or minus 3, plus or minus 2, and plus or minus 1. And of course, I like to start with the smallest one and move on to the biggest ones. All right, so what we're going to do here is plug in the number 1 and see if that gives us one of the roots. So we drop down the 1 over here. 1 times 1 gives me 1. Minus 4 plus 1 is minus 3. 1 times minus 3 is minus 3. Add that together, I get minus 2. 1 times minus 2 is minus 2. Add that together, I get a positive 4. So this is not one of the roots. Okay, so we tried positive 1. Now we're going to try negative 1. The next try is negative 1. And we have 1, negative 4, 1, and 6. Draw a line over here. Drop down the 1. Negative 1 times 1 is a negative 1. Add it together, I get negative 5. Minus 1 times a minus 5 is a positive 5. Add together, I get 6. Minus 1 times 6 is a negative 6. Add it together, I get 0. Bingo, there it is. One of our roots is x equals negative 1. Next, we try the number 2. So, so far, we found one root at x equals negative 1. Now, keep in mind that what we're doing, dealing with here is we're dealing with a polynomial of the third order. And we know that that graph must look lo something like this. Here's our y-axis. Here's our x-axis. Notice that the coefficient in front of the x cubed term is positive, which means that the function, when it's graphed, will probably look something like this, assuming that there are three roots, and that means also there will be a y-intercept. And so, so far, we found one of the roots at x equals minus 1. So let's see where the other roots are at. So hunting for the second root, now we're going to try the number 2. So the number 2 and the coefficients, again, are 1, negative 4, 1, and 6. Draw the line down here. Drop down the 1. 2 times 1 is 2. Add it together, we get negative 2. 2 times negative 2 is negative 4. Add it together, we get negative 3. 2 times negative 3 is negative 6. Add it together, we get 0. And again, we found another one of our roots. So, we can say that x equals 2 is another one of our roots. So, that would be x equals 2 right there. And let's continue on now. Uh, how about negative 2? I need a little bit more room. Well, I'm going to erase this. So it gives me a little bit more room to work with. Now let's try x equals negative 2. We have um, the coefficients 1, negative 4, 1, and 6. And now let's try x equals negative 2. 
draw the line down here, drop down the 1, negative 2 times 1 is negative 2, add it together, negative 6, negative 2 times negative uh, 6 is a positive 12, that gives me 13, negative 2 times this, minus 26, minus 20, and of course that's not one of our roots. All right, let's try, now we've tried plus and minus 1, we've tried plus and minus 2, now let's try plus and minus 3. So the next one we'll try plus 3. The coefficients are 1, negative 4, 1, and 6. Draw the line here, drop down the 1, 3 times 1 is 3, add them together, negative 1, 3 times negative 1 is negative 3, add it together, negative 2, 3 times negative 2 is negative 6, add it together, I get 0, and again, bingo, I found the third root, it's x equals 3. Now I'm ready to graph this function. I know that the general shape is going to be like this. I know that my first root is at x equals negative 1. My second root is at x equals 2. My third root is at x equals 3. So there are the three roots. I know that the function must look like this. So most likely we have something that looks like that. Now, for one additional point, we can find the place where it crosses the y-axis, and we can do that by setting, y equal to, by setting x equal to 0. When x is equal to 0, that's where we have the y-intercept. y will be equal to 6, so we know that this is the point 0, 6. Now, we're trying to find the domain and the range. After we've drawn it, we take a look at it, we realize that in the y direction there's no limit. The function can go up to any value in a positive direction. It can go to any value in a negative direction, so there's no limit to the, to the range. In the domain, same thing, as you go up higher and higher and higher, this, this graph will continue to move to the right. There's no limit as to how far it can go to the right. There's no limit to how far it can go to the left here, which means in the domain there's no limit as well. That, and that means that the domain is equal to all the x's such that the x is an element of all the real numbers and we can say that the range is equal to all the y's such that the y is an element of all the real numbers. And now you say well those are pretty easy ones and you're right they're fairly easy ones we've just put up some easy ones so you can see what the technique is obviously we have the technique of factoring we have the technique of setting up a table of values, plugging some x values, and then finding the corresponding y's. Or we can use synthetic division. All these methods are used to find, to, to find what the graph looks like. After we can, we can graph the graph or draw the graph, then we can find the limiting values on the graph, and then we can decide what the range in the domain is based upon that. It will become a little bit more tricky when we start doing rational functions. For example, we have a function in the numerator and a function in the denominator in such a way that you end up with asymptotes and there will have values that are prohibited, in other words, that x or y cannot be. And because of that, it will be a little bit more tricky to find that, but the general technique will be the same. So first we want to learn the methodology and now we're going to start applying it on more and more difficult problems so you can see how we actually find the domain and the range even when we have rational functions.